are back, and now it's time for Robert Kramer. And among his many uh, poetic accomplishments, Robert Kramer has distinguished himself on Poet to Poet before he's even said a word because he is the first guest in over 130 shows to give me two bios. And uh, one of them is handwritten I'm having a little trouble with, but uh, I'll do my best with them. Uh, he's a New York City native, uh, uh, did some time in the U.S. Army, uh, then went to Switzerland. And I understand that you have a, uh, a fellowship from the Swiss government. Yeah, they were generous enough, kind enough to give me a fellowship for a year's study at the University of Bern there, and it was a wonderful uh, year. What did you study? Uh, at that time I was studying primarily c comparative literature and art history. Ah, oh, that's a relief. I was afraid you were going to study banking. No, oh. next time. Oh, okay. Next time. Good idea. That's how we finance the books, I suppose. Uh, let's see. Uh, taught in New Orleans. Yeah, again, a very exciting city. In fact, my, my daughter was born there. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah. I would sometimes play the piano in the back streets of the French Quarter. Mm -hmm. uh, Outside? Or no, actually inside. Or in various no, establishments. No, no, no. The ones I wasn't thrown out of. No, no, no. <laughs> ah, and... Um, was this about the time that you were received your Fulbright Fellowship? Uh, actually, that came later. I had come back to uh, teach at Manhattan College, yeah. and, and I mm -hmm. received a, a Fulbright then to, uh, after I had finished my doctoral exams, I, yeah. I went to study at the University of Munich. And again, the German government was kind enough to give me a year to live over there to research and study. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what were you studying there? Again, uh, comparative literature and art history. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, let's see. You've done some uh, lectures at the Smithsonian, too. I think that's a first for us. Uh, yes, for people who wanted to travel and wanted to understand what they were getting into, yeah. into uh, cathedrals and, and churches, that I told them uh, what to look for, how to enjoy it, how to get the most out of it. Ah, did that get you to the cloisters as well? Uh, did it get me to the cloisters? Uh, I've gone there voluntarily. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, no, I was wondering if you, if you, if the Cloisters, uh, which is a, uh, a local uh, Manhattan uh, museum devoted to uh, medieval sure. and, and, and church art and architecture, I was wondering if it found its way into the lectures. Absolutely, absolutely, sure. sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's some fascinating stuff. Um, well, you do translations as well. Yes, um, yes. What sort of translations? Uh, mainly poetry translations. I've uh, translated f about 500 poems from German literature around the turn of the century, from the 90s, and I'm mm -hmm. planning to come out with an anthology of, of poetry from that period in translation. Mm -hmm. And then I've done <coughs> several hundred of 20th century poets. I've done medieval, Baroque, uh, published in various places. Um, any names that our, our viewership would recognize? Well, yeah. Um, Rilke, for example, uh -huh. or Hermann Hesse, when we had the Hermann Hesse centennial celebration, uh -huh. I did the poetry translations for, mm -hmm. for that, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's a very exciting supplement mm -hmm. to my own original creative writings, because when, when my inspiration is fallow, mm -hmm. then, then I can turn to a, a genius to inspire me and translate his works. Now, in translation, there are always a couple of phrases that you can't do literally. Um, what sort of work do you have to do to translate an idiom? Uh, <clears throat> reform it completely in your mind. Try to recreate the original experience that the native would experience in hearing those sounds, and try and bring that same experience to the American reader or listener. Do you find yourself having to uh, substitute an English idiom for, uh, for a German one? Yes, sure, sure, that, yes, mm -hmm. yes. All right. Yeah, Let's let's uh, let's get a taste of your own writing then. So, if you'd favor us with a poem. <coughs> well, right now I'm teaching primarily art history, mm -hmm. and I thought it might be interesting to see how uh, a poet can gain even from his professional occupation. So, mm -hmm. I'd like to uh, read a poem about a painting I encountered the summer before last, when I was doing some art historical research in Belgium. Mm -hmm. And this is called The Village Advocate by an unknown Dutch master around 1600. Arrogant and condescending, pointed nose, pointed beard, and pointing finger, the lawyer in his chamber, heaped with legal papers, letters, briefs, and crumbling documents, in every corner bundles of forgotten pleas, upon his desk, his quills, his blotting sand, his knife, and stains of ink spills laced with parings from his yellow fingernails, 
Confusion and chaos and mountains of paper that threaten to topple on the scattered sheets he now peruses. There is an odor in the room, or odors, the peasants, his clients, their sweat, big-bellied women, their wicker baskets filled with eggs, their unkempt men with unplucked chickens dangling from their fists, mud and manure clinging to their boots. The room is bursting with these bodies, physical, fleshly, producers of eggs and sperm, spewers of spittle and feces, wafters of redolent breath and flatulence, souls of oats and barley, cabbages and onions. They grovel now before their advocate. For the power of the robust body that must walk each day behind the steaming ox, the oak and iron plow through stony fields that each December must slaughter a hog and cut its throat amidst its screams and slit its belly, drain its blood in battered basin. This force encounters one yet more mysterious, the power of the written word, those enigmatic symbols scratched on paper that suggest a power remote, intangible, a force that shapes their lives, embodied now in a foolish man with slipping spectacles. Mm. Would you say that's a fair portrait of the, of the lawyer of the period? <laughs> yes, yes. And yes. this was uh, a painting by an unknown Dutch master. Mm -hmm. Oh, Jim, if you think he'd sign it. <laughs> we had Richard Levine, and he ended up being anonymous on one of his poems, and uh, now we got this with paintings, too. I detect a trend here. Mm -hmm. And speaking of trends, the trend calls for another poem. <laughs> I've always loved harbors and ports and uh, waterfront bars and the uh, unusual women and men with knives who inhabit them. Uh, it has a kind of archetypal feeling for me. So let me read a poem from a series called Orpheus. This is The Descent into the Underworld. A wisp of perfume in the night air, and you wander the twisting streets of the ancient city as they grow ever more narrow, follow their descending turns into ever greater blackness, past heaps of coiled hemp, the reek of turpentine and pitch and tar, past silent crumbling churches, the scent of spices, fish and urine, past another seaman, his back to you, leaning, hands against a wall with drooping head, convulsing back and shoulder. Past the last flickering lights in upper stories, in the shadows, the quick scurry of rats, the cobblestones that lump and pitch beneath your feet. You sense the nearness of the water, breathe the briny air of the harbor, the red wine still on your lips, your member rigid to the navel, impelled as in a dream to seek the first and final darkness. Are most of your poems based on classical themes? No, no. Uh, only when it resonates in our age, yeah. Uh, what else resonates for you? Uh, well, what resonates is my life, my children, the women I have loved, uh, my, late li my late wife. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're leading up to a poem. Okay. This, this is called The Widower. We swim together in the summer sea. Lazily we let our bodies twine. How buoyant are your breasts. Trade salt upon our tongues and sink beneath the waves. We cling together even as our heads rise up again to surf and sunlight. Body and being suspended in the tranquil summer sea. Or there, amid the endless rasp of a million crickets, locusts, katydids, framed by black and arching trees, a gabled house silhouetted black against a blue-black sky, as an upstairs window's yellow oblong frames another silhouette of a solitary woman, motionless in the fragrant summer night. And I float within that state between the dream and waking when the beloved dead seem still within my reach. And from the shattered past rise memories so private that there is no one now alive with whom to share them. 
And yet my mind runs on like the virtuoso still playing brilliant encores long after the audience has left, or the empty trapeze still rocking to and fro, still swaying in long, slow arcs above the fallen acrobat. For when a spouse has died, to the sole survivor now, those once shared memories grow all unreal, are shorn of their links to another soul and to the world outside, exist but in the mind of the solitary who remains, as doubtful shadows burning to be lived again, memories that seek corroboration and validity, or a slight conspiratorial smile from one who knows. That is touching. As time is uh, fleeting, I want to do uh, at least one more poem, so let's uh, go right into it. Upon the spiral staircase of farewells, when from high above, beneath the swaying lamp, you lean across the maple banister to watch a woman silently descend past dawn and bird's first cries, the spiral staircase of farewells, dissolving in the tempest spiraled eye, and then uncertain gestures hers and yours confused. You hesitate despite the urge to act as when you watch a wasp alight upon an infant's eye must wait until new flight or cry. Although the shadows loom and all is movement, you then must see with eyes discriminate, with eyes distinguishing between, well, let us say, between the white of eggshell and the white of table's cloth, or the white of turning eye and the white of pointed tooth. And in this skewered moment, you must judge, decide, both quickly and alone, upon the spiral staircase of farewells. Hmm. I want to turn back uh, to the Smithsonian for a moment. Uh, if you were invited to do a presentation on poetry for the Smithsonian, what would you tell people? <laughs> well, I, I prepare them for their trips to Europe. This is actually what I do for the Smithsonian. Uh -huh. So I would uh, perhaps combine the slides of art that I would normally show them with the poets who worked there, who were inspired by those, mm -hmm. by those works, by those scenes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, do you figure that the Vratopalax and perhaps medicinal purposes would end up in the Smithsonian on display somewhere? <laughs> Definitely, yes. Which, 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 which museum? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's going to make it to Washington, D.C. Well, that's, that's, that's good enough. Uh, might end up in the uh, Air and Space Museum as far as, uh, as, far as we're going. And uh, also, ah, you were a former director of the uh, New York Poets Cooperative? Yes, yes. What did you do there? I read manuscripts sent to me from all over the country, people, poets who wanted to give readings. So at 2 o'clock mm -hmm. in the morning, I'd be in the midst of boring... <laughs> uh, uh, Poems, and suddenly I'd hit somebody who was great, and this was the ex this made it all worthwhile. You discover somebody who's really got it, who's uh -huh. out there, and when I can invite them to New York and to give a reading in our mm -hmm. in our theater, that that made it all worthwhile. Yeah. And uh, were you ever uh, uh, tempted to give give advice to uh, those who were, shall we say, less than great? Sympathy. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> that was, that was, uh, <laughs> No, some of us will take anything we can get, as a matter of fact. As I'm sure you, you must have had moments with people sending stuff into... Uh, I certainly have. Uh, ...their of acts. Yes, there's some people whose cover letters are a great deal more creative than their uh, poetry. <laughs> I hate to tell you, but in the course of my poetic life, at least two magazines have printed my cover letters... <laughs> Is that true? ...and sent the poems back shredded. <laughs> <laughs> and on that happy note, I want to thank Judith Werner and Robert Kramer for coming on Poet the Poet. It has been a fascinating half hour worth of tall talk and, uh, and ideas. And uh, we will be back with another exciting show in our next slot. So be there.